Hello, and thank you for joining me in Annie Stories. In today's video, I'll be reading William Hoff's fairy tale called The Dwarf Long Nose. This was a very enjoyable story, and I think you will like it as much as I did. So without further ado, let us begin. The Dwarf Long Nose Many years ago, in a certain city in Germany, there lived an honest cobbler and his wife. The good man sat all day and mended boots and shoes. He made new ones, too, if he could get a customer to trust him with a job. But then he had first to buy the leather, for he was too poor to keep a stock in hand. His wife sold fruits and vegetables, which she grew in a little plot of ground outside the city gates. She had many customers, for she was clean and tidy, and had a knack of setting out her wares to be most advantageous. The cobbler and his wife had a beautiful little boy named Jacob. Although he was but eight years of age, he was tall and well-grown, and he sat by his mother's side in the marketplace and acted as errand boy to the housewives and cooks who made large purchases from his mother carrying the fruit and vegetables home for them. Very often, he came back with a piece of money in his pocket, or at least with a cake or some sweet meats, for he was so pretty and obliging that people liked to see him in their homes. One morning, the cobbler's wife was sitting in her accustomed place in the market. She had a supply of cabbages and other vegetables, fresh herbs and seeds, and a smaller basket of early pears and apricots. Little Jacob sat beside her and called out in his shrill little voice, Come by, come by, fine cabbages, fresh herbs, early pears, fine ripe apples and apricots. Come by, 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 my mother's goods are cheap today. An old woman came slowly across the marketplace. She was dressed in rags and tatters, and had a little pointed face, all wrinkled and furrowed with age, red-rimmed eyes, and a sharp hooked nose that nearly met the pointed chin. She helped herself along with a stick, and it is difficult to say how she moved, for she stumbled and limped and rolled along almost as though her legs were broken down wheels, which would soon give way. The cobbler's wife stared hard at her, for although she had been sitting in the marketplace every day for the last sixteen years, she had never noticed a queer old creature before. But she shuddered involuntarily when the old woman hobbled towards her and stood still before the baskets. "'Are you Hannah, the vegetable dealer?' she said in a cracked, unpleasant voice, her head shaking as though with palsy. "'Yes, that is my name,' replied the cobbler's wife. Is there anything I can serve you with? I must see, I must see, she replied. Let me look at your herbs and see if you have anything I require. She plunged her brown skinny fingers into the basket of herbs which had been so neatly set out, and grasping handful after handful, she put them to her long hooked nose and smelt them. The cobbler's wife was much put out to see her rare herbs handled in this way but she did not like to say anything, for it was the customer's right to examine the goods, and besides, she was half afraid of the old woman. When the whole of the basket of herbs had been handled and turned over, the old woman muttered, Rubbish! Rubbish! The whole lot of it! Fifty years ago, I could have bought what I wanted. This is good for nothing. The words angered little Jacob, you are a rude old woman, he said angrily. First you take up our beautiful fresh herbs in your nasty brown fingers and crush them. Then you put them to your long hooked nose so that nobody else who had seen you would want to buy them. And then you miscall our wares as bad stuff and rubbish when even the duke's cook does not disdain to buy from us. The old woman looked fixedly at the spirited lad and laughed in a repulsive manner. Then said she, in a hoarse croaking voice, Ah, my little man, do you like my nose, my nice long nose? Then you shall have a nice long nose too, one that shall reach from the middle of your face 
right down below your chin. As she talked, she shuffled along to the other basket in which the cabbages were placed. She took the finest creamy crisp heads and crushed them in her hands until they creaked and cracked, then threw them back into the basket anyhow. Bad goods, bad cabbages, she said. Don't shake your head to and fro like that, cried the little boy, beginning to feel frightened. Your neck is as thin as a cabbage stalk and looks as though it might snap in two. And if your head rolled off into our cabbage basket, who would buy from us then? So you don't like the necks, eh? muttered the old woman. Very well then, you shall have none at all. Your neck shall stick close down to your shoulders so that there will be no danger of its falling off your little body. Come, come, don't talk such rubbish to the child, said the cobbler's wife, vexed at length. If you wish to buy anything, make your choice, for you are frightening other customers away. Very well, answered the old woman grimly. I will buy these six cabbages, but you must let your little son carry them home for me, for I have to support myself on my stick and can carry nothing myself. I will reward him for his trouble. The little boy did not want to go and began to cry, for he was afraid of the ugly old woman, but his mother bade him go quite sternly. She would have been ashamed to let the weakly old creature carry such a heavy burden. So he put the cabbages in a cloth and followed the old woman from the marketplace. She walked so slowly that it was about three quarters of an hour before they reached her home, which was in a very out of the way part of the town, and which was a miserable looking little house. The old woman drew a rusty key from her pocket and slipped it into the keyhole, and the door sprang open. But what was little Jacob's astonishment on entering the house to find it most beautiful? The walls and ceilings were of marble, the furniture of ebony, inlaid with gold and polished jewels, and the floor of glass, and so slippery that the little boy fell down several times. The old woman drew a little silver whistle from her pocket and blew it so shrilly that the tones resounded all through the house. A number of guinea pigs at once came hurrying down the stairs, and Jacob was astounded to see that they were walking erect on their hind legs and had their feet thrust into nutshells instead of shoes. They wore men's clothing and had hats on their heads made in the newest fashion. Where have you put my slippers, you ragamuffins? asked the old woman, striking them with her staff so that they began to whine and jump about. How much longer do you expect to keep me standing here? The guinea pigs bounded up the stairs and soon returned with a pair of coconut shells lined and bound with leather. These they put on the old woman's feet and at once she ceased to hobble and limp, flung away her staff and began to glide about over the slippery floor with the greatest rapidity, dragging Jacob after her. She came at length to a room bearing some resemblance to a kitchen, though the tables were of mahogany and the couches and chairs covered with exquisite tapestries. Sit down, said the old woman in friendly tones, pushing him as she spoke into a corner of a sofa and then rolling a table in front of him so that he could not get out again. You must be tired walking so far and carrying such a heavy burden, she said. Now I am going to reward you for your trouble and make you some soup such as you have never tasted before and will remember all your life long. She again blew her whistle and again a number of guinea pigs appeared dressed in human attire. They wore cook's aprons and had cooking spoons and carving knives stuck in their waistbands. After them came a crowd of squirrels clad in wide Turkish trousers with little green velvet caps on their heads. They appeared to be the kitchen servants, for they at once began to clamber up and down the walls and brought pots and pans, eggs and butter, herbs and flour, and carried them to the fireplace where the old woman seemed to be very busy with her cookery. The fire burned merrily and the contents of the pan began to steam and hiss 
and sent forth a very pleasant smell. At length the soup was cooked, and the old woman poured some into a silver dish, and set it before little Jacob. Eat, my little man, said she, and you will have all that you have coveted in me. You shall become a clever cook too, but you shall never, never find the herb that was missing in your mother's basket. The boy did not understand what she was talking about, but he went on eating his soup, which was delicious. His mother often cooked tasty dishes for him, but never anything like this. An odor of fine herbs and vegetables arose from it. It was both sour and sweet and very strong. As he finished the last of it, the guinea pigs set light to some incense, which rose in a blue cloud and was wafted through the room. Thicker and thicker, the incense rose, and the little boy began to feel stupefied. He tried to rise, telling himself that he must hasten back to his mother, but he only fell back again, and at length, quite overcome, he fell fast asleep on the old woman's sofa. Then he began to dream such strange dreams. It seemed to him as though the old woman dressed him up in a squirrel's skin, and he was at once able to jump about like the other squirrels in the house, and began to take his place with them and the guinea pigs, and that, like they, he too became one of the old woman's servants. At first he was a shoe black, and it was his duty to polish the coconut shells the old woman wore instead of shoes. He had learned to polish shoes in his own home, and as his father was a cobbler, he had been particularly well taught, so that he was clever at his work. A year seemed to pass, and then he dreamt that he was given more important duties. He and some other squirrels were set to work to catch the sunbeam dust and sift it through fine sieves. This dust was used instead of flour to make the bread the old woman ate, for she had no teeth, and sunbeam dust makes the very softest and finest of bread. Another dream year passed, and then he was promoted to be one of the water carriers. You must not imagine the old woman kept a water cistern or a water butt handy. Oh, dear no! Jacob and the squirrels had to draw the dew from the roses into hazelnut shells. This was the old woman's drinking water, and as she was always thirsty, it was hard work to keep her supplied with it. At the end of another year, he was appointed to do the indoor work. His particular duty was to keep the glass floor in order. He had to sweep it over, and then wrap soft polishing cloths round his feet and slide up and down the room until the glass shone brilliantly. At the end of the year, he was promoted to the kitchen. This was a place of honor, only to be reached after long training. He began at the beginning as a scullion, and advanced rapidly until he was head cook. Sometimes he could not but wonder at his own skill, for he could cook the most difficult dishes, and could make no less than two hundred different kinds of pastries. Then he was a first-rate hand at soups, and could make every kind that had ever been heard of, and knew the use of every kind of vegetable that grew. Several years had now passed away in the service of the old woman, and one day she put on her coconut shoes, took her staff and basket in her hand, and prepared to go out. Before leaving, she told Jacob to cook a chicken for her dinner on her return, and be sure to stuff it well with seasoning. When he had prepared the chicken, he went to the room where the herb was kept to collect some to stuff it with, and to his surprise, saw a little cupboard that he had not noticed before. The door was ajar, and he peeped curiously in, and saw a number of little baskets from which issued a strong and pleasant odor. He opened one of them, and saw that it contained a very curious-looking plant. The leaves and stalks were of a bluish-green color, and it bore a flower of a deep red hue, flecked with yellow. He looked closely at the flower, then smelt it, and noticed it had the same scent 
as the soup which the old woman had once cooked for him. It was a very strong scent, so strong indeed that it made him sneeze, and he went on sneezing again and again until at length he awoke. He lay on the old woman's sofa and looked around him in surprise. How real dreams do seem sometimes, he said to himself. I could have been certain that I was a squirrel just now, and had guinea pigs and squirrels for my companions. Also, that I had learned to be a first-rate cook. How mother will laugh when I tell her all about it, but she will scold me too for having fallen asleep in a stranger's house instead of helping her in the marketplace. He jumped up in a hurry, but his limbs were stiff from sleeping so long, especially his neck. He could not turn it about very easily, and he seemed so sleepy still that he kept striking his nose against the walls and cupboards. As he stood upon the threshold, the guinea pigs and squirrels came whimpering around him as though they would like to go with him, and he begged them to come, for they were dear little creatures. But they went clattering back in their nutshell shoes, and he could hear them squeaking away in the house. The old woman had brought him a long distance from the marketplace, and he had some difficulty in finding his way back through the narrow lanes, especially as there seemed to be a great crowd of people. Somewhere near, he thought there must be a dwarf to be seen, for the people were pushing and craning their necks and calling out to one another. Just look, what a hideous dwarf! Where can he come from? What a long nose he has, and how his head is sunk between his high shoulders. He has no neck at all, and see what great brown hands he has. Jacob would have liked to have seen the dwarf himself, for he always liked to see anything extraordinary, but he could not wait, because he knew he ought to hurry back to his mother. He felt frightened and nervous when at length he reached the marketplace, for his mother looked so altered. He felt sure he could not have slept very long, for she still had a quantity of fruit and vegetables unsold. But she sat with her head leaning on her hand, never calling out to the passerbys to buy her wares. She was paler, too, and looked very sad. He hesitated as to what he should do, but at length he took heart and crept up behind her, and laying his hand caressingly upon her arm, said, Mother dear, what ails you? Are you angry with me? She turned to look at him, but started back with a cry of horror. What do you want with me, you hideous dwarf? she cried. Such jokes are out of place. But mother, said Jacob in alarm, you cannot be well. Why do you drive your son away? Have I not told you to go away, said Hannah angrily? You will get nothing from me by such jokes, you ugly creature. She must be out of her mind, said the little one. However shall I get her back home? Mother dear, look at me. I am your own little son, Jacob. Now you have gone too far with your impertinence, cried the woman. Not content, you hideous dwarf, with standing there and frightening my customers away. You must needs make game of my grief and sorrow. Neighbors, listen to this fellow, who dares to say he is my son Jacob. Her neighbors all came crowding round her and began to abuse poor Jacob in no measured terms, telling him it was cruel to joke with a poor bereaved mother who had had her lovely boy stolen away seven long years ago, and they threatened to tear him limb from limb if he did not go away at once. Poor Jacob knew not what to make of it all. He had gone that morning with his mother to the marketplace, or so he believed, had helped her set out her wares of fruit and vegetables, and carried home the old woman's cabbages, taken a little soup, and fallen asleep for a short time, and yet his mother and the neighbors declared he had been absent seven years, and they called him a horrible dwarf. What could have taken place? When he saw that his mother would have nothing to do with him, the tears came into his eyes, and he turned sadly away, and went up the street, 
towards the little shop where his father sat and mended shoes during the daytime. I will see if he will recognize me, he said to himself. I will just stand in the doorway and speak to him. When he reached the cobbler's shop, he stood in the doorway and looked in. The old man was so busy that he did not notice him at first, but presently, on looking up, he dropped the shoe he was mending and cried out, Good gracious me! What is that? Good evening, master, said the little man as he entered the shop. How is trade just now? Bad, very bad, little gentleman, said the cobbler. I cannot work as well as I did. I am getting old, and I have no one to help me, for I cannot afford an assistant. Jacob was astounded that his father should not have recognized him either, so he answered, Have you no son whom you could train to help you? I had one, Jacob, by name. He should be a tall, well-grown youth by now, who would have been able to be my right hand, for even as a little fellow, he was handy and clever at my trade. He was so handsome, too, and had such pleasant manners that he would no doubt have bought me more customers. Very likely by this time, I might have given up cobbling shoes and have made new ones instead. But alas, such is life. Where is your son, then? inquired Jacob with trembling voice. No one can tell, replied the old man. For seven years ago, he was stolen from us. Seven years ago, cried Jacob in horror-stricken tones. Yes, little gentleman, seven long years ago. I remember it as though it were yesterday. My wife came home from the market, weeping and wringing her hands. The child had been absent all day, and though she had searched for him everywhere, she had not been able to find him. I had warned her many a time to keep a careful eye upon our pretty boy, telling her there were bad folks in the town who might steal him for the sake of his good looks. But she was proud of him, and often, when the gentry bought fruit and vegetables of her, she sent him to carry home their purchases. But one day, an ugly old woman came into the market and began to bargain with her. In the end, she bought more than she could carry, and my wife, being a kind-hearted woman, let her take the boy with her. And, from that hour to this, he has never been seen again. And that was seven years ago? asked Jacob. Seven years, alas! We sought him high and low, and our neighbors, who had all known and loved the dear little fellow, helped in the search, but without avail. Neither could we hear any news of the old woman who had taken him away. No one seemed to know anything about her, except an old woman who was over ninety years of age, and she said she must be the wicked fairy Herbina, who visited the town once every fifty years to buy things she required. Thus spoke Jacob's father as he hammered away at his shoe and drew the thread backwards and forwards busily and the poor little fellow began to understand at last what had happened to him. It had been no dream, but transformed into a squirrel, he had really served the wicked fairy for seven years. His heart was well nigh, ready to burst with rage and grief. Seven years of his youth had been stolen from him, and what had he received in return? He had learned to polish coconut shoes and glass floors. Also, he had learned all the secrets of the art of cookery from the old woman's guinea pigs. He stood so long considering what had been said, that his father asked him at length, Can I do anything for you, sir? Do you require a pair of shoes? Or, he added with a smile, Perhaps a covering for your nose would be useful to you. What is the matter with my nose? asked Jacob. Why should I require a covering for it? Well, replied the cobbler, everyone to his taste, but I must say, if I had a nose like yours, I would make a case for it of bright red leather. See, I have just such a piece by me. A good stout cover for your nose 
would be most useful, for I am quite sure you must be constantly knocking it against everything that comes in your way. The little fellow's heart sank with fear. He felt his nose and found it was very thick and quite two spans in length, and so the old woman had altered his appearance too. That was why his mother had not known him and why everyone called him an ugly dwarf. Master, said he to his father, have you a mirror you could lend me? Young sir, said the father earnestly, your figure is hardly such as to give you cause for conceit, and you have no reason to look into a glass constantly. Break yourself of the habit. In your case, it is a foolish one. Believe me, it is not out of conceit that I wish to see myself, said Jacob, and I do beseech you to lend me a glass for a moment. I do not possess such a thing, said the cobbler. My wife had one somewhere, but I do not know where she has hidden it. If you really do wish to see yourself, you had best go across the road and ask Urban, the barber, to let you take a look in his. He has one about twice the size of your head, so go and admire yourself by all means. With these words, his father took him by the shoulders and pushed him gently from the shop, locked the door upon him, and went on with his work. Jacob, who had known the barber well in days gone by, crossed the road and entered his shop. Good morning, Urban, he said. I have come to ask a favor of you. Will you be so good as to allow me a glance in your looking glass? With pleasure. There it stands, he said, laughing heartily. And the customer who was being shaved laughed also. You are a handsome little fellow, the barber went on, tall and slim, a neck like a swan, hands as dainty as a queen's, and as pretty a little nose as one could see anywhere. It is no wonder that you are conceited and wish to take a glance at yourself. Well, you are welcome to the use of my mirrors, for it shall never be said of me that I was so jealous of your good looks I would not lend you my mirror to admire them in. Shrieks of laughter greeted the barber's words, but poor little Jacob, who had seen himself reflected in the mirror, could not keep the tears from his eyes. No wonder you did not recognize your son, mother dear, he said to himself. In the happy days, when you were wont to parade him proudly before the neighbor's eyes. He bore little resemblance to the thing he has now become. Poor fellow, his eyes were small and set like a pig's. His nose was enormous and reached beyond his chin. His neck had disappeared altogether, and his head had sunk down between his shoulders, so that it was painful to attempt to move it either to the right or left. He was no taller than he had been seven years before, but his back and his chest were bowed out in such a manner that they resembled a well-filled sack supported upon two weak little legs. His arms, however, had grown so long that they hung down almost to his feet, and his coarse brown hands were the size of those of a full-grown man, with ugly spider-like fingers. The handsome, lively little Jacob had been changed into an ugly and repulsive-looking dwarf. He thought once more of the morning on which the old woman had fingered his mother's goods, and when he had twitted her with her large nose and ugly hands. Everything he had found fault within her she had given him now, with the exception of the thin neck, for he had no neck at all. Surely you have admired yourself sufficiently, said the barber laughingly. Never in my dreams have I seen such a comical fellow as you, and I have a proposal to make to you. It is true, I have a great many customers, but not quite so many as I had at one time. For my rival, Barber Lather, has come across a giant and has engaged him to stand at his door and invite the people to enter. Now a giant is no very great wonder, but you are, my little man, Enter into my service, and I will give you board and lodging and clothing free. And all you will have to do is to stand at my door and ask folks to come in and be shaved 
and hand the towels, soap, and so on to the customers. I shall get more customers, and you may be sure you will receive a good many coins for yourself. The little fellow was inwardly very much hurt that he should have been invited to act as a barber's decoy, but he answered quite politely that he did not wish for such employment, and walked out of the shop. His one consolation was that, however much the old woman had altered his body, she had had no control over his spirit. He felt that his mind had become enlarged and improved, and he knew himself to be wiser and more intelligent than he had been seven years previously. He wasted no time in bewailing the loss of his good looks, but what did grieve him was the thought that he had been driven like a dog from his father's door, and therefore he determined to make one more effort to convince his mother of his identity. He returned to the marketplace and begged her to listen quietly to him. He reminded her of the days on which the old woman had taken him away and recalled to her many incidents of his childhood. Then he told her how transformed into a squirrel he had served the wicked fairy for seven years, and how his present hideous features had been given him because he had found fault with the old woman's features. The cobbler's wife knew not what to believe. Every detail he had told her of his childhood was correct, and yet she could not believe it possible that he could have been changed into a squirrel, besides which she did not believe in fairies, good or evil. When she looked at the ugly little dwarf, she found it impossible to accept him as her son. She thought the best thing that could be done was to talk the matter over with her husband, and so she collected her baskets, and she and Jacob went back to the cobbler's shop. See here, she said, this fellow declares he is our lost Jacob. He has described to me exactly how he was stolen away seven years ago, and how he has been bewitched by a bad fairy. Indeed, cried the cobbler angrily, he has told you exactly what I told him an hour ago, and has tried to take you in with his story. Bewitched was he. Well, I will disenchant this little son of mine. So saying, the cobbler took a bundle of leather strappings, and seizing poor Jacob, whipped him unmercifully, until the poor fellow, screaming with pain, managed to make his escape. It is strange how little sympathy is ever shown to an unfortunate being who happens to have anything ridiculous about his appearance. This was the reason that poor Jacob was obliged to pass all that day and night without tasting food, and that he had no better couch than the cold steps of a church. But notwithstanding, he slept until the morning sun rose and wakened him, and then he set himself earnestly to consider how he was to earn a livelihood for himself, seeing that his father and mother had cast him off. He was too proud to serve as a barber's signpost or to exhibit himself in a show for money, but remembering how excellently he had learned to cook when he was in his squirrel form, he thought it possible that he might make use of his art now. At any rate, he determined to try. He remembered to have heard that the duke who owned the country was said to be very fond of good living. And so, as soon as the day was sufficiently advanced, he made his way to the palace. End of part one. Please go to the next video for part two, the final part.